There are a lot of studies in obesity with mice that were conducted recently. Honestly, these studies should not be groundbreaking and should not be taken into consideration. The truth is that they are of no practical value. You are not a rat. What is true in rats is not necessarily true in humans. Thus, practicing them in your daily life may be of no practical value. You should be concerned with obesity in humans and not in mice. This book is all about obesity in human beings and how to go about obesity such as how to prevent it and even how to cure it in a practical, significant, and doable manner. There will be nothing less and nothing more. In Part 1, The Epidemic, we will tackle the causes and the studies conducted regarding obesity and how sometimes even medical doctors and practitioners are in the wrong. This is considering the fact that what conventional theory, eat less and exercise more, suggests is sometimes incorrect or incomplete either because of wrong sample size or incorrect analysis and interpretation of the data gathered. In Part 2, The Calorie Deception, we will tackle the theories and practical suggestions regarding exercise, overfeeding, and overconsumption that is based in the current caloric theory. In this part of the book, we will argue that it is not the reduction of consumption of calories that will lead to the prevention or cure of obesity. Thus, the current accepted fact that reduction of calories in one's diet does more harm than good. In Part 3, A New Model of Obesity, we will tackle about why obesity is actually a multifactorial hormonal disease and not a simple sickness of eating too much. In this part of the book, we also argue that you eat more because you are fat and not the other way around. You got fat because you ate a lot. This is because when you are fat and obese, you have a body set weight that is high and your body will adjust to that set weight every time like a status quo. Thus, even if you eat less calories for a period of time, your hunger pangs will get to you and your weight will go back to the status quo, your high body set weight. In Part 4, The Social Phenomenon of Obesity, we will tackle how obesity as a hormonal disease is caused by a number of social factors that includes poverty, bad childhood eating habits, and a whole lot more. In Part 5, What's Wrong With Our Diet, we will tackle how the three macronutrients in food, carbohydrates, protein, and fat, affect weight gain and how it leads to obesity. In Part 6, The Solution, we will tackle some practical tips and suggestions for prevention or cure of obesity, diabetes, and other cardiovascular diseases by addressing the root of the problem, hormonal imbalance, and high blood insulin, Instead of the fruits of the problem, symptoms such as weight gain and bad health. This includes eating a lot of healthy fat and fiber-rich food, keeping consumption of protein moderate, and avoiding sugary food and other refined grains. The Epidemic How Obesity Became an Epidemic Do you ever wonder why there are obese doctors? Doctors supposedly have the knowledge to determine the prevention of obesity, but how come these medical experts are obese themselves? How can they treat patients when they are likewise sick? Common knowledge tells us that obesity is caused by two things, eating a lot of food and refusing to exercise. In other words, fitness, or the lack of obesity, is only a matter of effort and discipline. Certainly, we cannot say that these doctors do not have effort and discipline because they already proved otherwise by finishing university, medical school, internship, residency, specialization, and other esoteric courses not designed for the layman then something might not be right. Effort and discipline alone will not prevent obesity. The truth is obesity is not merely a question of effort and discipline. Obesity is a disease which is caused by a lot of factors other than just pure laziness and lack of willpower to exercise and eat less. Proximate versus Ultimate Cause What is the cause of obesity? You may argue that it is excess of calories. Although excess of calories may indeed be the cause of obesity, it is not the ultimate cause. Now, what is the difference between a proximate cause and an ultimate cause? Simply stated, proximate cause involves immediacy, one thing immediately resulted to another thing, whereas ultimate cause involves a set of several linked events that does not necessarily mean it happened immediately. For example, let's take alcoholism. What is the cause of alcoholism? You may argue that alcoholism is caused by drinking too much alcohol in a given night. Sure, drinking too much alcohol in a given night might cause alcoholism, but it is a mere surface-level analysis. It is only approximate cause. Sadly, medical doctors will treat the patient by telling him, Hey, my prescription for you is to stop drinking alcohol behind this time set limit of. In the meantime, make no changes in your lifestyle, habits, or behavior. Now, what is the ultimate cause of alcoholism? 
It is a myriad of factors that include the addictive personality of the person involved, the stress he suffers at work or in his relationships, the alcohol's addictive nature, and the existence of family members involved in the same addiction. In this case, instead of treating the proximate cause, we would treat the ultimate cause. That is, by providing the addicted person with a rehabilitation program or social intervention support networks. Anatomy of an Epidemic Almost all of the human civilization before us did not suffer from this disease called obesity. Thus, humans were never obsessed with calories and how to eat less of it. It is a rarity. In fact, obesity has never been a thing until the last century during the period of massive industrialization of nation-states. During this period, humans produced and consumed a whole lot of starches, flour, sugar, and other refined carbohydrates. In other words, it is during this time when people started to become obese. This is probably the reason why people equated consumption of refined carbohydrates to obesity. There are three distinct macronutrient groups for all foods, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. The macro in the word macronutrient means that most of the food that we consume, or a big portion of it, consists of carbohydrates, protein, and fat. On the other hand, the micro in the word micronutrients refers to the small portion of the food we consume. These include vitamins A, B, C, D, E, and K, and essential minerals such as iron and calcium. Sugars and starchy foods are all carbohydrates. An interesting story is that of William Banting, an English writer and author who wrote and published what is known as the first diet book. William Banting was never obese until he reached his 30s. By his 60s, he became very huge for his own comfort. Because of this, he went to the physician on how to lose his unnecessary weight. He tried all kinds of stuff. First, he tried to eat less, which did not reduce his weight. Then he tried to exercise more, which only gave him a prodigious appetite, which compelled him to eat more than usual. In both these instances, his weight was not reduced. Finally, upon the advice of a trusted surgeon, William Banting tried a distinct approach that was truly ahead of his time. He did a very unusual thing. He did not eat less and exercise more, but instead he totally avoided eating refined carbohydrates, sugary and starchy foods such as beer, potatoes, milk, sweets, and white bread. Remarkably, he felt so well and reduced his weight to a desired one. Because of this, he became motivated and published his work Letter on Corpulence, addressed to the public, 1863, in order to guide the Englishman on how to prevent and cure obesity. This is why merely restricting calorie intake and having a low dietary fat diet, which is backed by the government and other pharmaceutical companies, simply does not work. It is not excess of calories and dietary fat, but rather excess of sugars and other refined carbohydrates that lead to obesity. The truth is, the more you eat carbohydrates, the more you become obese. Conversely, the less carbohydrates you consume, the less chances you'll have to become obese, even sans the eat less and exercise more mantra. Inheriting Obesity Nature versus Nurture It is an undeniable fact that if you have family members who suffered from obesity, you have a high chance of becoming obese yourself. The question is this, do you become obese because of your genes, nature, or because of your upbringing and environment, nurture? The accepted theory by many scientists is that nurture seems to be the culprit. Nature cannot be the cause because obesity only proliferated during the 1970s and genes cannot change in such a short period. Nurture is a more viable cause due to the fact that a person living with obese family members in the same environment is likely to have the same eating habits, same lifestyle, same vices, same physical exercise regimen, and same health overlook. Thus, conventional knowledge places the blame solely on the environment for being toxic and encouraging a sedentary and unhealthy lifestyle, increased use of computers, more meals eating out, increase in portion sizes of food, etc. This is called an obesogenic environment. This seems to be logical, right? Except that it is wrong. There was a study conducted by Dr. Albert J. Stunkard in Denmark regarding the level of obesity of the adoptees, their biological parents, and their adoptive parents. The simple logic is this. If nature and genetics are the determining factor, then the adoptees will have a similar level of obesity with their biological parents. On the other hand, if nurture and environment is the determining factor, then the adoptees will have a similar level of obesity with the adoptive parents. 
Interestingly, Dr. Stungford found that there was no relation at all between the levels of obesity of the adoptees with that of their adoptive parents. Why is this so? Clearly, the biological parents have nothing to do with the upbringing of the adopted child and thus have not taught them to eat less and exercise more or to avoid calories and fats. Nevertheless, when an obese biological parent gives away his child to a thin, fit, and healthy couple, willing to raise it in a healthy environment, an anti-obesogenic environment, the child becomes obese. And another study conducted by Dr. Stunkert, he has the same conclusion and even argued that obesity is 70% genetics. Thus, obesity is more often than not inherited. If your parents are obese, there's a high chance you will become obese as well. This is regardless of the environment you are raised. The Thrifty Gene Hypothesis According to the Thrifty Gene Hypothesis, all human beings by nature and as a survival mechanism are predisposed to gain weight. The theory behind this hypothesis is that eating as much as possible and storing food in one's body has a certain survival advantage because there were a lot of times which the Homo sapiens, our ancestors, didn't have access to food. Nothing could be further from the truth. A fat Homo sapien is less agile and slower than a lean Homo sapien. Thus, a fat Homo sapien is less likely to catch an animal and eat it as its food. Thus, the fat Homo sapien is less likely to survive and to continue its genetic material to its children and grandchildren compared to the lean, faster, and more agile Homo sapien. Fatness, therefore, has no survival advantage at all and can even cause the demise of the species. To test this theory, let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a fat lion or a fat tiger able to catch its prey? Never. A fat lion or a fat tiger will only be able to consume food if it belongs to a zoo. If it is in the wild, it is not likely to survive and will likely die of starvation. The Calorie Deception The Calorie Reduction Error According to recent studies made by scientists whose theory has been conventionally accepted, a person's weight and chance of suffering from obesity can be attributed to this simple arithmetic equation. Body fat equals calorie in minus calories out. This is what is called the calorie deception. This seemingly simple example to a person's health and well-being is dangerous and harmful because of its wrong underlying assumptions. For this reason, let us examine the following five false assumptions. These assumptions are based on the already discredited theory that caloric reduction, reducing one's caloric intake, is the key to weight loss. Also, these are the reasons why mere reduction of calories is ridiculous and may in fact be harmful. Assumption 1. Calories in and calories out are independent of each other. Assuming that calories in, caloric intake, and calories out, caloric expenditure, are independent of each other is incorrect. This has already been proven as an outright falsity by numerous experiments regarding the subject. Instead, the reality is that caloric intake and caloric expenditure are closely dependent to each other. They have a mutually dependent relationship. This means that an increase of one will result to the increase of the other and vice versa. Therefore, if you reduce your caloric intake, your caloric expenditure will be diminished by necessary implication. Consequently, the general medical advice to reduce one's caloric intake is simply an unsound advice because the outcome is minimal to negligible weight loss. Assumption 2. Basal metabolic rate is stable. Except for exercise, people are going bananas over measuring their caloric intake without regard to their caloric expenditure. This habit is due to a misconception. Sure, the obsession over caloric intake may be justified by the fact that it is relatively easy to measure. However, measuring the total energy expenditure of the body is an entirely different ballgame. In fact, it is a complex problem to measure because it will depend on the following factors. Exercise, excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, thermogenic effect of food, and basal metabolic rate. As such, since caloric intake is easy to measure and caloric expenditure, except for exercise, is a too complex problem, people conveniently but wrongfully assume that it remains constant. The fact of the matter is it does not. Depending upon the caloric intake as well as other factors, total energy expenditure can go high or low for up to 50%. Assumption 3. We exert conscious control over calories in. Eating is done by mechanically putting food into your mouth, chewing them, and then ingesting them. Is eating a conscious decision? The answer is no. Eating is deliberate, but not conscious. 
Although eating is a deliberate act, it is by no means conscious because hunger plays a key role. Hunger is caused by our hormonal activities and will determine whether we will continue consciously consuming food. Thus, in an all-you-can-eat buffet setting, people stop eating when they are feeling full and thus no longer hungry. In fact, after a person is already full, the smell of food he had just ingested will make him feel queasy and nauseous. Assumption 5. Fat stores are essentially unregulated. All systems in our body are regulated by our cells, a genetic mechanism. This means that our bodies flow and grow smoothly because of our genes. For example, our growth hormones regulate our height and built. Estrogen and testosterone regulates our sexual maturation. Free thyroxine and thyroid-stimulating hormone regulates our body temperature and others. With respect to our blood sugars, it is regulated, as a general rule, by our glucagon and insulin. It is like everything is automatic. But something is not right. Conventional theory states that fat cells' growth is an exception to the general rule meaning they are unregulated at all. This conventional theory simply cannot be true because there are already hormones that were found to regulate fat cells' growth. These are the following. Liptine, adipose triglyceride lipase, lipoprotein lipase, hormone-sensitive lipase, adiponectin. Therefore, if fat cells' growth is regulated by hormones, obesity is also caused by your hormones. Assumption 5. A calorie is a calorie. This is the most crucial assumption that needs to be struck down because it is very harmful to believe otherwise. A calorie is not simply a calorie. Sure, you can say that a dog is a dog, but what dog? Not all dogs are created equal. Some are small, some are big, some are skinny, and some are fat. Is the dog Chihuahua, Labrador, or Shih Tzu? That is the logic. A calorie is not simply a calorie because some causes weight gain while some does not and in fact gives you a health boost. A calorie from sugar will cause weight gain through metabolic response while a calorie from olive oil will not and is in fact a healthy choice. A calorie from sugar will cause significant increase in blood glucose or insulin while a calorie from olive oil will not. Consequently, simply measuring one's caloric intake is an exercise in futility. The Exercise Myth Exercise and Weight Loss The usual theory of people venturing into weight loss programs and diets is that reduction of food intake must go hand-in-hand -hand with the proper exercise regimen. Their line of thinking is that even if your diet is good, if you do not have a proper exercise regimen that you follow religiously, you will not lose your weight. This is just plain wrong. The truth is that even if you have an improper exercise regimen, if your diet and gradual reduction of refined sugar and other carbohydrates in your meals are consistent, you will lose weight. However, this is not to say that exercise regimens are useless. To an extent, they are effective because they induce physical exertion and activity, except for the fact that they likewise induce hunger pangs afterwards. The point is that diet and exercise should not be treated as equals. Generally speaking, Diet should be placed at higher importance than exercise. They are Batman and Robin instead of Mac and Cheese. According to studies, over 95% of a weight loss program's effectiveness will depend on the consistency of one's diet. Thus, even if you exercise a lot but gorge yourself in hamburgers afterwards, you will not lose weight. In fact, you might gain more weight and it will be more than you imagined. Exercise is like brushing your teeth. Sure, it may prevent the occasional cavity or even bad breath, halitosis. However, it will not cure an already decayed tooth. Diet is like taking the already decayed tooth out of your mouth. Compensation, the hidden culprit. Why is it that most weight loss programs are ineffective at best? We try for weeks and months to follow this exercise program to no avail. Sometimes, instead of curing and preventing obesity, our weights instead increase. First, like previously asserted, a person will likely eat more, vigorously more, after exercise than when he or she did not exercise at all. As a consequence, the usual effect of exercise is not weight loss, but weight gain due to the increase of food intake. If you ingest more food, then, by definition, you increase your calorie consumption. According to a study made by the Harvard School of Public Health, there is a consumption of an extra 292 calories for every extra hour of exercise. Thus, the argument that the relation between caloric intake and expenditure are intimately and proportionally dependent to each other is very plausible. An increase in calories in will necessarily result to an increase in calories out. 
This is consistent with the biological principle that the body attempts at all times to maintain stability, homeostasis. Second, if you perform exercises for the entire day, you are more likely to skip exercise the next day. This is because, generally speaking, you will be tired the next day and your body and muscles will be sore due to the overexertion. As a result, you are less likely to be consistent in your exercise regimen. This phenomenon is especially true for young adults and teenagers according to a recent study conducted. The Overfeeding Paradox Overfeeding Experiments Unexpected Results How do you know if overeating causes obesity? It is simple. Just take a few volunteers or test yourself. Measure there your weight intentionally and deliberately overfeed or overeat for a certain period of time, such as a week, and then afterwards, measure there or your weight and see the difference. If the results of the measurement are higher than the previous week, then certainly your hypothesis that overeating causes obesity is correct. However, a study conducted by Dr. Ethan Sims in the late 1960s provides a different conclusion. It turns out that eating a lot of food does not necessarily result to weight gain or obesity. How is this possible? The rationale for this is that the human body has a certain cap or maximum on how much food one can intake. Thus, whenever you eat in a buffet, you will not continue eating after you are already full. This is an automatic mechanism of the body. In addition, the overeating causes an increase in the metabolism, which quickly cuts out the excess fat. This study conducted by Dr. Sims was supported by experiments in recent vintage, such as those conducted in 1992, and another conducted by Dr. Frederick Nystrom regarding fast foods. The undeniable conclusion is that even if you overeat to the point of fullness, calories in, you will not become obese. Consequently, even if you reduce your calorie intake, you will not be cured of obesity. A new model of obesity. A new hope. When the body is ordered by the hypothalamus to increase fat mass so as to achieve a desired set weight of the body, obesity develops. The end result is that the body becomes short of energy because the available calories are diverted to increase fat. In this way, the acquisition of more calories is the natural predisposition of the human body. If this happens, there is a reduction of the hormonal signals of satiety and an increase in the hormonal signals of hunger. What people usually do is simply reduce their calorie consumption by refusing to eat, even though the urge to eat is sometimes unbearable. This has the effect of temporarily stopping the hypothalamus. As a result, metabolism slows down. Truly, eating more and exercising less, increase calories in and decrease calories out, is the effect of obesity and not its cause. As stated, there is a tight regulation in the body's set weight of every person. This means that, by and large, the body set weight of a certain person remains the same except for a few highs and lows here and there. A drastic reduction or increase in the body weight of a person will likely happen gradually for at least several years. A study conducted by scientists revealed that a person's weight is relatively stable. At most, the weight gain or weight loss of a person having the same eating regimen as an increase or reduction in their body set weight of about 1 or 2 pounds a year. A thin person will not become fat in a year and a fat person will not become thin in the same period. It just would not happen if the regimen is the same. Therefore, understanding and recognizing the factors that regulate the body set weight of a person is the key to curing and preventing obesity. In addition, the reason why a person's body set weight is so high compared to another person should be learned. Finally, how to reset the body set weight of a person to a lower level will likewise be important. Insulin The results of recent studies conducted regarding the effect of insulin to obesity are enlightening. Weight loss is the end result of drugs that lower insulin levels. Weight gain is the end result of drugs that raise insulin levels. There is weight gain or loss effect with respect to drugs that have no effect on insulin levels. Therefore, weight gain or loss and obesity and fitness can be predicted by the levels of insulin on the blood. Not exercise, not support group or family pressure, not caloric intake versus caloric expenditure, and certainly not discipline, just insulin. In other words, obesity is caused by insulin. This further means that insulin is a factor that regulates the body set weight of a person. As stated, the body set weight of a person goes up as insulin levels increase. Conversely, the body set weight of a person goes down as insulin levels decrease. Therefore, we can say that one of the keys to resetting the body set weight of a person to a lower level is simply reducing the insulin level in the blood. Why is this so? 
Imagine that you simply follow the conventional dogma, that is, to deliberately reduce calories in without regard whatsoever to your insulin levels. Even if your caloric intake is in the floor, if your insulin levels are high, the hypothalamus will send out hormonal signals to the body to gain weight. That is, you will become hungry and then you eat until you are full. At this level, your body set weight is so high compared to an ordinary person. So the end result is you become obese. Therefore, you do not become obese because you overate yesterday or last week or last month. You overeat because you became obese. And why did you become obese in the first place? Because your body set weight is very high as a result of high insulin levels within your blood. The bottom line is this. Obesity is not due to caloric imbalance. Obesity is a hormonal imbalance. Cortisol. The less you sleep, the more likely you are to become obese. One of the most prominent causes of chronic stress in the modern era is sleep deprivation. According to a recent study, sleep time of people has been declining steadily. For example, in the early 20th century, 9 hours is the average amount of sleep. Today, less than 6 hours is the average amount of sleep for one-third of adults. This is especially true for shift workers who sometimes have to work in the wee hours of the morning and have difficulty sleeping at all during the noon. If you lack sleep, you will not only suffer some serious psychological stress. In addition, your body's hormones will stimulate cortisol. A high level of cortisol in the human blood will result in high levels of insulin and also insulin resistance. Both key hormones in the control of body fatness and high level of human appetite, ghrelin and leptin, have a set level of activity and rhythm that should not be disturbed in any manner whatsoever. Generally speaking, this means that the ghrelin should not be increased and the leptin should not be decreased by sleep deprivation. If this body rhythm is so disrupted, such as by a lack of sleep perhaps for several days, cortisol levels are increased. As a consequence, insulin levels will likewise increase, which will cause a person to increase his body set weight and get fat. The end result is the person becomes obese and overeats. Therefore, the simple lesson is this. If you want to lose weight and prevent or cure obesity, you should have a good night's sleep every night to prevent the rising levels of cortisol in your body. Not only will you prevent the disease, you will also lessen the psychological stress you will suffer from sleep deprivation. The Atkins Onslaught Generally speaking, compared to other macronutrients, carbohydrate-rich foods causes insulin levels to increase in a manner that is really harmful to a person that is already obese. This is because high levels of insulin in the blood of a person are danger signs. They may trigger the complications of obesity. The concept that it is the consumption of carbohydrates that causes obesity because of excess insulin that result to insulin secretion, otherwise known as the carbohydrate-insulin hypothesis, is correct. However, it is incomplete. Remember, people in Asian countries are predominantly rice eaters. Their diet consists mostly of white polished rice, which is highly refined. In China alone, more than half of every Chinese person's meal per day, about two-thirds, consists mostly of this white rice. It is the same thing in Japan, North and South Korea, and in Southeast Asia. If this is the case, then you would logically presume, following the carbohydrate-insulin hypothesis, that levels of obesity would be higher in Asian countries, right? And the answer is no. Compared to studies on the U.S. population, the level of obesity in Asian countries is comparatively lower. On the surface, this seems to be a paradox. If high consumption of refined carbohydrates is the culprit of obesity, then why do Asians not suffer from it a lot? On TV and in the media, for example, you can rarely see an obese Chinese or Japanese, except when you're watching a sumo wrestling show. The reason is that the sugar consumption of Asians is way lower than that of their U.S. counterparts. Thus, compared to other refined carbohydrates such as white rice, the consumption of sugar itself contributes a lot to obesity. This is not to say that refined carbohydrates will never lead to obesity, but only that compared to sugar, the former has more dire health effects than the latter. Insulin Resistance, the Major Player There are two essential elements for insulin resistance to take place. First, there must be high levels of insulin in the blood. Second, there must be persistence of such high levels within a given day. The consumption of refined carbohydrates, which in turn increased the insulin levels in the blood of a person, was already prevalent even in the 1960s. In fact, Oreos and candies such as M&M's, Mars, and Hershey's were already established brands by that time. But why is it that obesity during that time was almost non-existent compared to today? 
The answer lies with the insulin resistance. You see, in the past, in other words, the 1960s, daily eating opportunities were only divided to three, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. A person is likely to eat from 6 a.m. in the morning to 6 p.m. at night, divided into three meals. From 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., the person is in fasting mode, low insulin levels. Thus, there were low insulin levels for at least 12 hours out of the 24-hour period. Remember that there must be persistently high levels of insulin in the blood for there to be insulin resistance. In this case, resistance is not likely to happen. Compare this with the situation from the 1970s up to today. Daily eating opportunities are increased from three meals a day to six meals a day at least. And sometimes people even have several midnight snacks. No wonder many are getting fat. At this time, therefore, people are eating all the time. Before, meals can only be done at the dining room. Now, everybody eats everywhere. You can eat at your work desk, in the car, in the theater, on a bench, in the living room while watching TV, and the list goes on and on. Thus, the reality is, instead of starting the day with low insulin levels, such as in the 1960s, we are now at a point where we start the day with high insulin levels. This is the perfect recipe for insulin resistance and has become a very vicious cycle. The Social Phenomenon of Obesity Big food, more food, and the new science of diabetes. Snacking, it won't make you thin. There are a lot of consistent studies made recently that confirm the hypothesis that frequently having snacks have a result in increasing your overall intake of food. This is notwithstanding the fact that the contents of the food that you ate with your snacks are little or light compared to full-size meals. This only means that snacking will lead to a habit of more eating and thus will result in weight gain or obesity. This is especially true when the composition of snacks includes sugary drinks such as Coca-Cola and Pepsi and sugary candies such as Hershey's, Baby Ruth's, and M&M's. It was found that these sugary snacks result in fats and high insulin blood level. Thus, the idea or conventional theory that frequent snacking makes you eat less because you become less hungry all the time is just not true. Moreover, it is incorrect to state that frequent snacking or increased meal frequency have the net effect of weight loss and thereby prevents obesity. It is apparent that it does the polar opposite. Breakfast, the most important meal to skip. Eat like a king at breakfast. Eat like a prince at lunch. Eat like a pauper at dinner. This seems to be the conventional theory, is it not? Nowadays, people give an enormous value to breakfast. Even medical doctors themselves suggest and advise people to avoid skipping breakfast because it is the most important meal of the day. Otherwise, you will, allegedly, lack the vitamins and minerals, nutrients, amino acids, and energy to seize the day in school, at work, or at play. Or is it really? Is breakfast really the most important meal of the day? This requires examination. Practically speaking, no person needs to eat upon waking up. It is only an ingrained habit from childhood that ones eat sugary cereals, bagels, cinnamon, ham, eggs, and or bacon in order to get started for the day. In fact, if you will observe your body in the morning from deep sleep upon the ringing of the alarm clock, you're not hungry at all. If you're not hungry at all, why do you feel the need to prepare a breakfast in the first place? Isn't it more productive to get your day going by preparing the things that you will need during the day instead of being paranoid about your breakfast? Biologically speaking, breakfast isn't really necessary. Do you want to know why? The human body has that thing we call a sympathetic nervous system, which is activated by our inherent fight-or-flight response. This fight-or-flight response upon waking up, although only to a mild extent, is released by a person's adrenaline and cortisol within the body. Thereafter, the person's body has quick energy in the blood because of the glucose released by the hormones. This means that upon waking up, you are ready for work and not a sit-down meal. The New Science of Diabetes it was concluded by recent research that excess high insulin in the blood, or at least persistent insulin levels over a long period of time, causes at least two related diseases, one, obesity, and two, diabetes type 2. Both are caused by what is called in the medical circles as hyperinsulinemia. The reason is that hyperinsulinemia results to blood sugars being elevated and thereafter becomes a symptom of the diseases. Together, these two diseases are called diabetes because they can happen or be incurred by a person simultaneously. As a result, instead of improving the health of a person, giving insulin-infused drugs to persons suffering from these diseases will merely make things worse. Poverty and Obesity 
It has long been assumed by the world that one's status in life in terms of economic wealth will determine whether or not one will suffer from obesity and or diabetes later in life. For example, in the United States alone, federal states with the most poverty incidents likewise have the highest number of obesity and or diabetes according to the statistics. So, poverty, at the end of the day, is something to keep in mind regarding this health problem. Now, the question is, how come? What is that factor in poverty or low economic status that leads on to suffer from obesity and or diabetes later in life? Is it the lack of healthy or nutritious green leafy food, physical exercise, or lack thereof? The answer is none of the above. The clear-cut reason for the massive weight gain of poor people is simply their diet, which consists mostly of refined carbohydrates. The explanation is this. Poor people or those suffering from poverty, will by and large choose affordable food over high-priced and expensive ones. For example, in the United States, a protein-filled lean beef or pork loin steak may cost $10 or $20. Compare this to an entire pack of pasta and noodles, which may cost $0.99, cents, or an entire bread loaf, which may cost $1.99. Between the two, the latter is more affordable and at the same time makes a person feel relatively full. In addition, Fresh fruits and vegetables and healthy green leafy salads may cost between $7 up to $15. Meanwhile, processed food consisting of refined carbohydrates such as potato chips and french fries will only cost a fraction of a dollar. No wonder poor people always choose cheaper foodstuff to their personal detriment. Has this always been the case? Why are unhealthy and highly processed refined carbohydrates very low priced compared to unprocessed healthy foods and vegetables or even unrefined carbohydrates? This dates back to globalization when the government, in order to promote the efficiency, competitiveness, and productivity of capitalistic industries, gave subsidies or big financial aid to big-time producers of agricultural products that included refined carbohydrates to the prejudice of other small-sized businesses, mom-and-pop stores, and poor farmers of healthy goods. Thus, when the time comes that these industries take advantage of economies of scale, producers of healthy goods such as blueberries, broccoli, cabbage, and other vegetables and fruits are already out of business. Only a few will continue the production and business of these healthy foods because it just won't make economic sense to continue losing money over continuous cultivation. The consequence of this is that the supply of healthy goods and food in the market will plummet, which will cause its prices to rise. Hence, it will not be attractive to poor people. Conversely, there will be an oversupply of mass-produced refined carbohydrate products that will cause its prices to fall and make it more attractive to poor people. Thus, many foods rich in salt, sodium, bad cholesterol, fats, and sugar are very affordable to poor people, especially to students. In order to make them fuller and to give it lots of content to these customers, these kind of foods are packed with processed and refined carbohydrates. In other words, Refined carbohydrates give these processed foodstuffs some fluff in order to make them more affordable and at the same time appear to be stuffed. Thus, people suffering from poverty will, without a doubt, choose cheap food over healthy and more expensive food. Consequently, their bodies shall be daily gorged with refined carbohydrates that will lead them to bad health consequences, obesity, and other similar diseases. Childhood Obesity as early as 1946, Dr. Benjamin Spock, a pediatrician and practicing medical doctor and author of the seminal book, Baby in Child Care, had already taught parents and patients of his practice about the close relationship between childhood experiences, habits, and attitudes, and the grim prospect of obesity later on in a child's life. In his book, he bluntly stated that rich desserts can be omitted without risk and should be by anyone who is obese and trying to reduce. The amount of plain, starchy food, Cereals, breads, potatoes, taken is what determines how much weight they gain or lose. Truthfully speaking, this is what a mother of common sense will say to her growing child. Eat less sugar, eat less carbs, eat less salts, and even avoid them altogether if possible so as to live a long and healthy life. In addition to the eating habits of a child, the unscrupulous focus on a child's exercise program or regime is also something that should be kept in mind. Again and again, weight loss programs that are based on exercise regimen are failing every single year because it is a daily effort that is unsustainable. Despite this fact, many health department agents and policymakers are forcing school-age children to make their physical education classes strenuous and rigorous with the end in mind of losing weight. At the end, this program does not achieve anything because kids are being forced to exercise while their diets are not at all changed. 
in order to combat obesity, the only solution is to change their diets. What's wrong with our diet? The deadly effects of fructose, sugar. Sugar makes you fat. That is a fact that is already accepted by a number of medical authors and experts. The fact that sugar is not avoided in the daily diet of a person, but instead is encouraged by the media, society, and advertisements, is actually curious because people who are already warned of the harmful effects of sugar in the body, even in the late 1970s, by the 1977 Dietary Guidelines for Americans. In this guideline, Americans were told not to eat foods, meals, and snacks containing a lot of sugar for its adverse health effects, including fatness and obesity. Nevertheless, the said warnings were not heeded because during the time, there were people protesting in the streets in favor of allowing people to get fat because fat is sexy and any size you want is sexy. It is not politically correct to reprimand a person because of his or her size, even to the detriment of that person's life. Because of this anti-fat hysteria, the guidelines never even got a momentum and the sugar content of products was simply ignored by the consuming public. It is like eating unhealthy becomes cool. As a result, candies, chocolates, and other products containing sugary stuff such as jelly beans proliferated in the groceries, convenience stores, and supermarkets. In fact, from 1977 to 2000, Sugar consumption together with rates of obesity, diabetes, and other similarly natured diseases arose. By far, the worst offender, or the product that has the highest amount of sugar contents, are sodas, soft drinks, Coca-Cola, and Pepsi. Sweetened processed fruit juices and processed teas and milk teas. In fact, during the turn of the century up to today, the soda industry became a $75 billion industry, and thus its profit margins are very profitable to the detriment and prejudice of the health of their customers. To an extent, sodas are said to be addictive because of the advertisements, and they tend to make meals allegedly more rewarding and fulfilling. Thus, its overconsumption is encouraged in every meal of the average American. The Diet Soda Delusion On paper, diet sodas appear to be a healthy choice compared to the regular sodas with which we know are packed with lots of sugars and cause obesity and other diseases. This is because diet sodas have no sugar at all and contain very little calories. Thus, the logic is that if you want to lose a lot of weight and greatly reduce your chances of becoming obese, you don't need to sacrifice your daily soda cravings every time you sit down for a meal or snack. You just have to buy diet soda instead of the regular one. When done every day, you will go toward a healthy and fruitful life. Or is it really? The answer is in the negative. Diet soda drinkers are delusional. Instead of being a healthy alternative, diet sodas are in fact a deadlier choice compared to your regular run-of-the-mill sodas. Why is this the case? A study conducted at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at San Antonio by Dr. Sharon Fowler in 2008 found that diet sodas substantially increased the risk of obesity by a mind-boggling 47%. According to Dr. Fowler, these findings raise the question whether artificial sweetener use might be fueling rather than fighting our escalating obesity epidemic. In addition, a study conducted at the East Coast USA at University of Miami in Florida found that the constant habit of drinking or consuming diet sodas for every day may cause or is related to the high chance of suffering from strokes, heart attacks, and other cardiovascular diseases that will result to death or at least a bypass operation. According to said studies, the reason why these artificially sweetened beverages are more harmful than regular sodas is that they increase insulin levels in the human blood despite the fact that they contain no sugar. For example, artificial sweeteners such as aspartame, stevia, and sucralose increase insulin by 20%. It is important to remember that the number one cause of obesity, weight gain, and diabetes is not sugar, but the insulin that sugar triggers. Hence, even without sugar, diet sodas are not good to one's health. Thus, artificially sweetened beverages are more harmful, and they are not beneficial to one's health at all. Carbohydrates and Protective Fiber We now know that the thing that drives obesity and diabetes in adults and children alike is the high levels of insulin and its resistance in the human body. Generally speaking, the most common cause of insulin and insulin resistance is the consumption of white flour and white sugar, otherwise known as refined carbohydrates. The consumption of these types of foods, i.e. refined carbohydrates, causes people to get fat and then get sick. However, not all carbohydrates are essentially bad. We should distinguish between good carbohydrates and bad carbohydrates. Both are carbohydrates, but they have distinct health effects. 
Good carbohydrates promote health and wellness, while bad carbohydrates promote obesity and diabetes. The good thing is that even if you overconsume good carbohydrates, you will still be in the pink of health and no adverse effects will happen. Thus, saying that anything too much is bad simply does not apply in this case. It certainly applies in bad carbohydrates, though. Now, what food contain good carbohydrates so that you can start eating healthily? You can usually consume good carbohydrates in whole fruits and vegetables such as broccoli, spinach, and other green leafy vegetables. Why is it that bad carbohydrates, usually found in refined ones, are prejudicial to one's health? This is because bad carbohydrates, which are refined, are usually purified and concentrated, thereby increasing the glycemic index of a person. In the process of purification and concentration, the fat, protein, and fiber are removed entirely from the carbohydrate itself. This simply means that the refined carbohydrate can be quickly eaten, digested, and absorbed. In turn, this quick process promotes overconsumption by people. For example, making a juice product will necessitate six or seven oranges. Drinking the juice product will be very easy when compared to actually eating six or seven oranges. Thus, by the forced removal of everything other than the carbohydrate itself, people start overconsuming products. This is why fiber, which decreases the energy density and bulks up food, is very important in everyone's diet. In a way, fiber encourages satiety, or feeling full, even after you've eaten just a small amount of food. Protein Different kinds of protein have distinct effects with respect to stimulating insulin in the human body. They are as follows. Protein acquired from dairy is high on the insulin index, 90 to 98, but low on the glycemic index, 15 to 30. Protein acquired from milk, which consists of largely of lactose, is 80 with respect to casein and 20 with respect to whey. This is because dairy has two general types. Casein is normally found in cheese and whey is normally found from the cheese curds in the process of its production. Compared to casein, whey is more widely used, especially in the fitness world, because gym goers and bodybuilders believe that whey is crucial in the formation of muscles in their shoulders, abs, lower back, and legs. This is because of its inherent high levels of branched chain amino acids. Whey, however, compared to casein, shall cause higher insulin levels, even higher than the usual bread or pizza, because of the effect of incretin. Is the consumption of dairy in everyday meals a healthy choice? According to recent studies conducted in certain parts of America, consumption or even overconsumption of dairy is not associated with weight gain, obesity, and diabetes. In fact, the studies found that instead of prejudicing the health of a person, dairy actually promotes weight loss. This is despite the fact that it may increase insulin levels upon consumption. How about the consumption of meat? Is it a better choice? No, according to studies conducted by researchers, if you were to choose to overconsume either dairy or meat, always choose the former. However, this is easier said than done. Overconsumption of dairy is way more difficult than overconsumption of meat. For example, drinking a gallon of milk or a huge slab of cheese in one sitting or in one lunch is way more difficult than eating a meat in the form of a half chicken or a large steak. Fat Phobia According to Harvard researchers Drs. Frank Hu and Walter Willett, 2001, it is now increasingly recognized that the low-fat campaign has been based on little scientific evidence and may have caused unintended health consequences. The conventional theory made by so-called medical experts in order to demonize fat may be summarized as follows. Avoid getting fat, and if you are, you should reduce your fat by restricting your diet with margarine, sausages, beef, lamb, pork, and other fatty products. Instead of using solid fats, use vegetable oils when cooking. These so-called recommendations became an advice that everybody believes and practices religiously for almost half a decade now. But according to recent developments, these are wrong. The National Cholesterol Education Program clearly states that the percentage of total fat in the diet, independent of caloric intake, has not been documented to be related to body weight. This means that scientists and medical researchers, despite their humongous efforts, cannot find a single solid piece of evidence that will pinpoint the fact that dietary fats directly cause obesity in humans. On the other hand, there is already a recent overwhelming evidence by studies conducted in recent years that there is no association whatsoever between consumption of dietary and obesity. The truth is, even the conventional theorists do not believe in the association between the two because their original recommendation is that dietary fats 
may lead to heart diseases. Obesity was not stated, but was merely thrown in. The solution, what to eat. As previously stated, obesity is a multifactorial disease. As such, it has several overlapping pathways that lead to the same direction. Nevertheless, it has a common root, hyperinsulinemia. However, there are different things that you must keep in mind. Different strokes for different folks. For a portion of the population, hyperinsulinemia is caused by their overconsumption of refined carbohydrates and other sugars. For these people, a diet that is low on carbohydrate may be deemed best. For the rest of the population, hyperinsulinemia is caused by insulin resistance. For these people, the best way to lose weight and to improve their health is to practice intermittent fasting or meal timing. Nevertheless, since obesity is multifactorial, it would be best to pair your diet with other strategies that will necessarily and are proven to cause weight loss, such as correcting sleep deprivation, stress reduction techniques, and eating a lot of fiber in every meal. You can also reduce the production of cortisol in your body. This has been discussed in the preceding chapters. A key idea here is that everyone must practice to reduce your consumption of added sugars. Sugar, comprising equal parts of fructose and glucose, and sometimes sucrose, is a sinister ingredient that wreaks havoc inside your body. Not only does it stimulate insulin secretion, it also increases insulin in the body in the short term and in the long term. Fructose alone is dangerous to your health because it directly contributes to the insulin resistance inside your liver. Over a long period of time, your liver will be overworked and overexerted. As such, it will usually lead to an even higher level of insulin. The best foods to eat are still fresh vegetables and fruits. Whenever possible, you should choose vegetables and fruits that are locally grown and are fresh from the farm rather than those that are clearly manufactured and already processed. There are a lot of other things you can do in order to avoid obesity. Whenever you feel like you want to eat a delicious cake, why not eat the healthy cake alternatives such as seasonal cherries and berries with whipped cream? Not only is it healthy, it is more affordable than a whole-size cake. In addition, whenever you get the urge to eat potato chips or french fries, why not eat the healthy alternatives such as cheeses and a small plate of nuts? Also, instead of drinking sodas and sugar-sweetened drinks, why not choose plain sparkling cold water instead? Finally, instead of eating refined grains such as pizza, tortillas, cakes, donuts, and muffins, why not eat the healthier alternatives such as cucumbers, cabbage, cauliflower, asparagus, bell peppers, broccoli, peas, kale, eggplant, carrots, and spinach? You can do a lot if you are willing to try new things. When to eat. According to Marie Antoinette, there is nothing new except what has been forgotten. The answer to the problem on when to eat is one word, fasting. When talking about the word fasting, this does not mean a mere 6 to 12 hours fast in a single day. That will not do a lot. Instead, fasting should be at least 24 to 36 hours in one single instance. This is to totally break insulin resistance and thus lose weight. Every person is well adapted for physically dealing with fasting or the absence of meals and snacks per day. Fasting is very beneficial to the human body because during periods of fasts, food scarcity, the body switches from glucose burning in the short term to fat burning in the long term. This is because, simply, stated fats are those elements in the human body which are stored as food energy. Without fasting, they are merely stored, tentative, and have no practical value. Therefore, during periods of fasts, Fats, or that element stored as food energy, are automatically released in order to allow the person to have the energy for their specific activities. Bodybuilders and gym goers should not worry that fasting may burn the muscles that they gain from weightlifting and exercise programs. During periods of fasts, it is the fats which are burned and used for energy and not the muscles. Thus, muscles will not be burned unless all the fats stored in the body are used up. Burning all the fats in the human body through fasting will take a very long time. Experts also are of the opinion that fasting is also the most consistent and efficient means of massively reducing the insulin levels in the human body. Over a period of several weeks of several series of 24 to 36 hour fasts, you will observe and notice that you have lost a lot of weight and hence will have cured or prevented obesity and diabetes. Over a period of a year, the practice of fasting is not only beneficial to your health, but also to your overall spiritual, emotional, and psychological well-being for having the mental fortitude to come up with a fasting plan and stick with it for 365 days will be astoundingly noticeable. Good luck. In part one of this book, The Epidemic, we tackled about the underlying causes of obesity and we shed light on how the patient's family history will affect his chances of obtaining this disease. 
We argued that obesity is a hormonal imbalance disease and not simply a matter or a lack of mental fortitude or discipline in one's own life. We gave an example of a study where an adopted child got fat, even if his adopted parents gave him a good environment within he ate a healthy lifestyle. Nature versus nurture debate. In part two, the calorie deception, we tackled arguments about why the current conventional theory about obesity, reduce calories, exercise more, and the overfeeding paradox is short of effectiveness. In part three, a new model of obesity, we described the very essential role of insulin resistance in preventing and curing obesity. Thus, it was argued that it is insulin resistance that is really needed to be understood by patients and other stakeholders in this disease over anything else. We also experienced the theory of insulin and the regulation of one's body set weight. In part four, the social phenomenon of obesity, we explain how poverty affects obesity. In fact, it was argued that the poorer you are, the higher the chance that you will become obese. This is because government subsidy actually promotes the mass production of cheap, greasy, and unhealthy foods. Thus, it can be argued that healthy foods are not very affordable and thus not accessible to those below the poverty line. We also tackled how childhood habits affect one's chances of suffering from obesity. In Part 5, What's Wrong With Our Diet, we tackled one of the most evil causes of obesity, sugar. In addition, artificial sweeteners are not beneficial to anyone. In fact, it is more harmful and dangerous than sugar itself. We also tackled why diet sodas should be avoided more than regular sodas themselves. Thus, we argued that we should avoid sugary food and other refined carbohydrates if we want to achieve massive weight loss and prevent the adverse repercussions of obesity. Finally, in Part 6, The Solution, we tackled why fasting, particularly intermittent fasting, is the one thing that will set apart a patient that will avoid or cure obesity from a patient who will suffer obesity all of his or her life. Despite overwhelming evidence of the effectiveness of fasting, it is not practiced by many people. In addition, we tackled why intermittent fasting would be a great way to prevent the resistance of insulin in the human blood without suffering from the prejudicial effects of calorie reduction in one's diet. We also argue that improving one's sleeping habits, reduction of stressful situations, and stress-inducing environment so as to reduce cortisol levels will go a long way in forming a holistic habit in losing weight and preventing and curing obesity. All in all, the Obesity Code set forth a framework for understanding the condition of human obesity. We hope that this book gives you fresh framework towards a healthier future.